Good evening, good evening. Welcome back to this, the last of the workshops for the fall 2020 semester of the InfoSec Club. Um, if you're here, you're one of the diehards. You've made it all the way to the end. Congratulations, good on you. We're happy to have you here. Uh, it's been a very long semester of lots of work and lots of work all by yourself at home alone. But once for two hours, every week on Monday, we get to spend this time together. That's right, just you and me, just here, just on a Monday evening, right at the end. I'm happy you came. Let's start on some binary exploitation. All right, uh, let me share my screen with you. Let's go with screen one. Um, so uh, don't forget to sign the attendance form uh, for this week to make sure that you are here. And let me get the link for that. No, that's the link to the files. Ah, Emily's got me covered. She's got the link there. Um, and let me get you the link to the files. Um, so these are all the files for the workshop tonight. Um, Yes, those are all the files for the for the workshop tonight. Uh, you might remember the if you were here for reverse engineering, I gave you all the binaries and none of the source code. This week you're going to get all the source code, so you don't have to be tricky. Uh, we did some last minute tricky work and managed to get managed to get uh, some of these challenges deployed onto droplets so that we can hide flags in them so that you can get points because that's why you're here and that's what it's all about. Um, so yeah, if you follow that first link, it'll ask you to download a zip file that contains all of the all of the binaries and the source files. Like I said, it's going to look like this. There's a bunch of them in there. Um, these are all compiled, and then you can look at the source code if you want to. Uh, and you're going to need to likely on some of them. You're not going to be able to do this blind. So I'll give it, uh, let's say, one more minute, people to get that taken care of. We're going to be using, uh, if you remember, there was an announcement. We're going to be using Pwn Tools. Um, you should have installed that already. Um, if you have, good. If you haven't, uh, rush, rush, rush. There's still a little bit of time. It doesn't take very much to install it. Uh, you can go to the Pwn Tools website and run a few commands, and it'll download everything for you. It's something that we will be using in future workshops. It's really, really useful for uh, binary exploitation and poning challenges. Um, we will use it. I think there's two more uh, shell code and drop chains. There's two more binary uh, workshops that we're going to be doing, and they both include. They're both going to be using uh, pwn tools. You'll see it uh, really commonly out in the wild when you're out there trying to do this stuff for real. Okay, we're going to start moving on now. So attendance is signed and files are downloaded. So welcome to the introductory to binary exploitation uh, buffer overflows. First off, uh, thank you to Dr. Henry. He helped us when we were originally building this uh, last year when this club started, actually back in like January. Um, this was all brand new to us. Uh, Alex and myself, when we were just getting the club set up, we did our first CTF and we were in the computer labs until 3 a.m. trying to get a basic buffer overflow challenge to work. Um, they're really tricky. They can be very challenging. And that's because everything has to be just right uh, for them to work. You can get the idea. And by the end of tonight, you're very likely going to understand the idea of how this works. But you might not be able to get it to work uh, on your first try, maybe not even on your 10th try. And that's because you might be off by one somewhere and it doesn't work. Um, it can be very unforgiving. but when you finally get that first challenge, it's going to feel great. And Alex can tell you um, that when we finally got that challenge working at 3 AM in the ComSci labs, uh, we were really happy. I was so happy that I yelled and banged my fist on the table. Uh, Alex thought I was angry that it didn't work again, but we'd got it. Um, yeah, it was almost a broken hand, almost a broken hand. All right, uh, yeah, so Dr. Henry helped us out a lot. Um, he has a course, I'll mention it again later, Computer Science 525. 
uh, where you learn all about these things. This is going to be the very basic introduction to that. So this is like the first two or three classes uh, for 525. But he has a whole assignment that is based around these ideas, but they're much more challenging. Uh, so if you're here now, uh, you'll at least be exposed to these things, which will help you out later on if you're going to keep going. So the goals of this workshop, we're going to learn about buffer exploitations. Uh, we're going to learn how to recognize vulnerable functions in C, in the C programming language. We're going to analyze vulnerable programs. And we're going to execute a buffer overflow. Some helpful courses are Computer Science 355, Computing Machinery. Uh, we've talked about that before. It really helps if you've seen uh, assembly, how the stack works, how memory uh, works in, in programming. Um, and of course, 525, the principles of computer security that uh, Dr. Henry currently teaches. Uh, this is the core idea of most of what you're going to do, a lot of what you're going to do in that course. So tools we're going to use are GDB, and we're going to use Pwn tools. Uh, we're going to use both of these to get these uh, things to work. So I'm going to show you how uh, sections, how some of uh, some of the functions in Pwn tools work to help us. Uh, by the end, you should recognize how how to set up a basic buffer overflow uh, in a script using Pwn tools. So uh, we're going to go back to basics. Uh, this works much better in person uh, because people can actually shout things out. But the question is, what are these? 10 seconds on the clock, what are these? Two, one. Correct answer is strings. Yep, I got a few people saying it. These are all supposed to be strings. These are th uh, ways to declare strings in three different programming languages. Uh, so good, we, we're all starting at uh, square one. We all know what these are, that's good. Question is, what is a string? If you didn't read the answer that just popped up. String is data. Yeah, some people might have read the slide. The answer is, uh, a string is a sequence of characters. A string is just made up of a bunch of characters. This, for example, is the string hello world. It is made up of uh, a bunch of characters, and we know how to spell hello world. What is a character? Three, two, one, a letter. Yep, character is a letter. Sometimes they're not letters though. Uh, a byte and binary. Yep, those are, those are all good answers. Uh, the answer I've got is it's a data type uh, in most programs. It has a size of one byte in most programming languages. And what is a byte? Getting real, getting real down low into like first year computer science. What is a byte? Nice. First one gets the points. It is eight bits. So that is a byte. Those are. Eight bits. Big question, what's a bit? And points for two nibbles, that's that's a very technical one. Yeah, a one or a zero. People got it. It's a binary digit. It can be a one or a zero. Uh, good, so now we've gone way down to the bottom of what a string is. So we said that a string was a sequence of characters like hello world, but we can also think of it as an array of characters. And in C, that's exactly what a string is. A string is simply an array of characters. So hello world can look like this. Uh, we got our brackets on the end. It can be held in an array as a bunch of characters. And in the C programming language, uh, strings are always null terminated. So this thing over here, this represents a null character. In C, that's how uh, the language knows where the string is ends. It always has one of these at the end. Uh, so uh, for you that haven't seen C very much, uh, just a tip that uh, strings are usually one byte longer than you think they are because there should be a null terminator at the end. So yeah, we have an array of characters. 
And we said that characters are just bytes, so we can also think of it as an array of bytes. What bytes? Well, we go back to our ASCII table, uh, our old friend. I really want this uh, made into a poster and just put over my bed so I can stare at it at night and memorize it. Because if I had a nickel for every time I've gone to ASCIItable.com, I'd have a lot of nickels. Uh, but we represent them in hex bytes specifically. So this is different ways of representing all of these characters on the side. Let me pull the highlighter out. Uh, so if we want to represent an N, we can represent it in hex as 4E. Um, and this is the column that we're going to care about here. This is how uh, we're going to represent our bytes in this workshop. So the string hello world then looks like this. These are the bytes of each one of these characters. Remember the space counts as well. So this is just translating the character into its hex representation. Each one of these uh, represents a byte and they get put together and that's what hello world can also look like. And in computer memory, um, it gets stored in binary. And if that binary were translated into hex, it would look something like this. Um, so the computer stores it uh, in a different fashion, not in ASCII, but in something that will represent ASCII. Um, so this is really important to understand that strings in C are held in an array, that that array is made up of a bunch of characters, which are actually represented by hex and or binary. So good, we know what a string is. It's an array of bytes and it is terminated by a null character. So we'll move on to part two, old school buff. Uh, so what is a buffer? Uh, people can toss answers into the chat if they want, but a buffer is just a place uh, to hold uh, some information. It's used really commonly in C to hold user input. Um, yeah, it's common in C and C++. Um, so you can take a look at the first program. Yes, there we go. What is a buffer? Best answer right there. Uh, something that screws up all my assignments. Uh, good. I'm, I'm happy that people are familiar with what buffers are. Uh, and have run into the frustration of having to deal with them sometimes. Um, but yeah, you can start, uh, you can open up those files and you can take a look at buffer zero. Uh, so this is the first program that we're gonna play around with. Uh, you can see what it does. Uh, for, again, for those of you who aren't familiar with C, I know we went over this in, uh, in the reverse engineering workshop, but um, this is the main function. This is where the program starts. Uh, what it's doing here is it's declaring a, a character array. So char is the type. This is an array of characters. The variable is called buffer. It will hold 44 characters. So it'll be the equivalent of 44 bytes. That's important to, to remember. Um, so it declares that. And this is what a string looks like in C. Um, a string isn't its own data type. It's just a character array. Um, so then it's gonna print, enter your name. It's then going to run this function gets, which will take your input and put it into the buffer. And then it will print out what your name is using printf. So go ahead and give that one a shot. Uh, where is, that's what I'm looking for. Um, go ahead and give that a shot. And also you can try buffer one. Uh, so buffer one is the exact same program, except for one thing, um, it's going to use scanf. Uh, so the last one used the gets function, this one uses the scanf function. So play around with those two programs, you should be able to get them to give you different answers um, to this, to the, the, they should print different things out uh, with the same input and see if you can figure out what they're doing um, to, to print out different things. So uh, what you're gonna do is you're gonna run both programs. You're gonna give them the same input and you want them to print different things and see if you can figure out why that is. So we'll go ahead and give you guys, uh, let's give you three minutes to play around with those.
So some of you might have figured out what the difference is. It's not big. It's it's really not huge. They're just two different functions to get input, but they they do things slightly differently. If you can figure out what the slight difference is based on trial and error or some other way, uh, you will have figured out what I'm trying to show you. And toss it in chat if you figured it out. Thirty more seconds. Let's do it in Cali. So I have the files here. Uh, they're unzipped. And we'll go ahead and play around with them. Um, I want you to remember that in order to run these, you're going to have to chmod them. Um, you can chmod 0777 and then just star if they're all in a directory and you just want to change them them all, um, as long as they're not in with other things that you'll change the permissions of. You can run that, and it'll make them all executable. So we want buffer 0. And I'm going to put my name in. And we're going to try buffer run one. I'm going to put my name in. Same thing. Uh, now, the reason I asked for your name is I wanted you to do this. So it tells me my name is Jeremy Stewart. And then when I do this, it tells me my name is Jeremy. So there with the same input, we've got two different outputs. Um, what's going on? One of them is taking everything I write, and the other one seems to be only taking my first name. What is it about my first name? Let's give it something different, and it only takes the first A. The reason for this is that uh, scanf and gets are variations on generally the same function. Um, gets will read everything until the, I believe it's the new line character, whereas gets will read up until uh, a space. It'll read up until, um, it'll read up until there's a, a space, a white space or a new line. So I believe I have it here. Um, yeah, so gets will read user input until it hits either a new line character, uh, the end of the file, whereas scanf will read until it hits a new line, end of file, or white space. So when I put a space in my name, uh, scanf was only taking the first part. It doesn't read anything after the space. Uh, why did I make you do this? Well, I wanted you to play around uh, with these two, um, and I'm just curious if... Anyone noticed anything else weird that was happening? Scanf stops taking input of the space. Yeah, yeah, that was right. Um, screwed me up on my 355 assignments. That's right. Yeah, they do almost the exact same thing, but they're slightly different. Um, we're going to look at a, a little bit at why that is exactly. Uh, that's what I want. Um, and we can go to the manual for these things, if you remember. Really important. Uh, we can go to the manual to see why that is. Um, now if I remember correctly, yeah, <laughs> it's going to give me that. Um, but if I do man gets, um, I can get the manual for the gets function, and it'll tell me exactly what it does. So it reads from std in into a buffer pointed by s. Whereas here, you can see it's gets, and it's reading it into s. Uh, until either a terminating, terminating new line or end of file, which it replaces with a null byte. Because remember, that's how it knows where the end of the string is. Um, and then man scanf. This is the description of scanf. Quite a bit longer than gets was. Um, but yeah, essentially, they do almost the exact same thing, just a slight difference between them. Ah, so, right. 
Um, I want you to play with this again, and I want you to see if you can crash the program. Um, some of you might have played around with this and got some pretty awful response from it. Um, anyone in 355, it's one of the faults that haunts your, your dreams every night. Yeah, someone... Someone got it. Uh, they got a seg fault. Um, so your program crashed. Uh, the question is, why was it doing that? Yeah, seg faults. Everyone loves seg faults. Um, why was it doing that? Well, it uh, it turns out that your character buffer can only hold so much stuff. If you try to put in more, uh, bad things start happening. So. Go ahead and give buffer zero uh, another shot or buffer one and see if you can get the seg fault. Um, I have too many tabs open as usual. But let's try buffer zero. Um, and it has 44, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. Well, that wasn't what I wanted, but I got a seg fault. Um, <laughs> buffer zero. Um, so this is what we do in binary exploitation for anyone that's new to this. Uh, when we get a program, what we do is we scream at it. Uh, this became a running joke last year when we started the club that everyone just goes ah, at a program as a test. Um, it then tries to read it to us back. It says that your name is this, and it gives us a seg fault. So a seg fault is the program crashing. Uh, that's really, really bad. We don't want programs to crash. Uh, they're not supposed to. Uh, this is a toy program, and it's OK when it crashes. Um, so yeah, we can get the program to crash. Why does it crash? It's because uh, gets and scanf do not check bounds, uh, which means it doesn't check the limits of the buffer. So if you tried this in Java and Python, they would throw exceptions. Um, they're, they're built not to allow this kind of thing to happen. C and C++ don't do this. They don't check the bounds uh, depending on the function. The function doesn't check the bounds on the buffer, and so can fill it and then keep writing outside of it. Um, and this is a really, really bad thing, because as you saw, it causes programs to utterly crash and burn. Uh, so what? So uh, what happens is actually that some compilers refuse to compile programs with gets. Uh, you need to force them uh, before they'll allow it sometimes. Uh, scanf and gets uh, and others are just big problems. Um, if we look at the programmer's manual for gets and the programmer's manual for uh, string copy, which is another another one of these vulnerable pro, uh, functions that doesn't check bounds, uh, there's big warnings in them, uh, and we'll take a look at them. Um, so when you compile programs with gets, you get a warning. Uh, the manual for gets has a section for called bugs. The first line of bugs is never use gets. This function in its manual tells you to just never use it. Um, the warning it gives you is pretty funny. It's impossible to tell without knowing the data in advance how many characters gets will read. And because gets will continue to store characters past the end of the buffer, it is extremely dangerous to use. Uh, it has been used to break computer security. That's, that's just a very general line. It just breaks computer security. It says to use fgets instead. Um, fgets is um, a secure version of gets. Uh, fgets will take an argument for how much input it's supposed to take, um, and it says for more information you can see you can see this. Um, that's the gets manual. Uh, the string copy manual is one of my favorite entries uh, ever in a in a computer manual. Um, it says if the destination of str copy is not large enough, then anything might happen. Overflowing fixed length string buffers is a favorite cracker technique for taking complete control of the machine. Anytime a computer reads or copies data into the buffer, the program first needs to check that there's enough space. This may be unnecessary if you can show that overflow is impossible, but be careful. Programs can change over time, 
and in ways that make the impossible possible. That just sounds ominous. That's not very technical language for a computer manual. Um, these manuals are usually very specific, very technical, and these two read like horror stories or tales that your grandfather would tell you as you sat on his lap about computers. Um, they're just really ominous. They tell you about mysterious, impossible things happening um, and anything happening in the future. Uh, when you try to compile with gets, this is what the compiler throws at you. Um, it throws at you this warning. It says, uh, implicit declaration of gets. Did you mean F gets? Um, and this is the compiler basically saying, I noticed you're using gets. You're not supposed to be using gets. What you, what you probably want to be using is F gets. And then it gives you the warning that gets function is dangerous and should not be used. Um, this compiler allows me to compile with it. There's some out there that just refuse to do it. Some will just say, no, you're using gets. I'm not going to be responsible for this. Change it, and then I'll compile your program for you. Um, they just have security baked in. And it's because these things are such a problem. Um, how big a problem are they? Well, uh, this, was, uh, this was last year, 2019. Um, this is a list of common vulnerabilities uh, that you get to see out in the wild. And all of these things that I've highlighted on the list are basically uh, binary exploitation problems. Um, so integer overflow, uh, if you're in 329 in my tutorial, we went over that uh, last week. Um, but improper restriction of operations within the bounds of a memory buffer, basically a buffer overflow. Uh, out of bounds read, which is something we'll, I'll show you at the end, it's something similar, and out of bounds write. Uh, these are all examples of buffer overflows. As you can see, they're high up on the list. In fact, they are the highest on the list. Uh, and notice that its score over here is really high, like almost double what the what the next, the next highest uh, vulnerability is. Um, just for fun, you can look down the list and notice some of the things on here are things that we've done in the past. SQL injections are pretty high up there. Cross-site scripting is a workshop we're going to be giving next semester uh, that Emily uh, is going to lead us through. Um, yeah, but buffer overflows, really high up there. Um, we don't have time for this. Yeah, I'm going to say we don't have time for this. Um, this is a video that shows the popularity of programming languages over time. Um, what you would see here is that the C programming language and C++ uh, were very popular for a long time uh, and were the most popular for a while. Uh, they're no longer the most popular, but they're still in the top 10 uh, for programming languages. Um, and the problem is that these functions that we've just seen, they exist out in the wild in programs. Uh, they've been updated in a lot of places, but uh, they still exist, and the core problem here, the buffer uh, overflow, uh, is something that you will see all over the place. In fact, uh, every I'd say every couple of weeks, uh, a news news story comes out that says that there's been some big security flaw in some program, and usually what it comes back to is somebody has managed to get a buffer overflow uh, executing in a program. Um, so C and C++ are known as systems languages. They're used in Windows, Linux, OS X. Um, they are used in iOS and Android. They program those. Uh, databases uh, like Oracle and MySQL all use C and C++. That accounts for the majority of databases uh, that exist in the world, I believe. Um, vehicle electronic systems use C and C++, so your car uses these programming languages. Uh, even airplanes use C and C++. It's, it's everywhere. Um, and it's in big, very important things. So uh, it's really, really important uh, as, as a language. It's used in systems, um, so like control systems uh, for things like we are listed here. Um, and last year, I made a joke uh, about it being in pacemakers. And uh, hopefully, someone manages to overflow your heart. Uh, and if you find that special person, blah, 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 blah. Um, but these things are seriously being used today uh, still. They still cause problems. So we're going to look into exactly how they work uh, and why they're still such a big issue. Um, and as an example, in Computer Science 525, the class where we, we deal with buffer overflows, um, somebody posted, why are we learning about this? This is such an old thing. It came out like almost 20 years ago. Um, actually almost 25 years ago now, 
Um, why is it still such a, a big deal? Why aren't we learning uh, more common things? And the answer was because these things are still being used and they're still causing most of the security vulnerabilities out there. It's everywhere. Um, it's everywhere and it's still a big problem. And it's really important to learn. So we're going to keep going. So why is the seg fault such a big issue? Uh, these questions that you're going to have. Uh, why is it on the top of that list of vulnerabilities? If the program just crashes, how can that be hacked? And so now we're going to jump into learning about the stack. Um, I'm going to assume that most of you have not uh, learned about the stack. And if you have, it's only just the beginning. Um, so we go into random access memory. No, not that one. It's really great, though. Um, this one. So when we represent memory in diagrams, it tends to look like this. Um, it tends to be this really long uh, rectangle here. It's got a bunch of things over on the side. Uh, what is what does this represent? Uh, well, this represents memory. Um, this is uh, the main block of memory here. These things on the side are addresses. So memory uh, is addressed, meaning that each block in memory has an address associated to it in the same way that each house on a street has an address associated to it. Um, the computer assigns these. Uh, it's something called virtual memory. We're not going to go into all of that. You'll eventually see how that works um, in, I believe, third year uh, computer science. But suffice to understand that up here, the addresses start at 0. And down here, they end with the highest possible address, uh, depending on how big the memory is. Um, so these numbers are smaller, and they get bigger as you go down through the memory, through all of the things that are in here. This memory is divided up into sections. Um, the bottom section down here is known as stack memory. And this is the memory that a program uses when it's running. So every time a function gets created, it puts something in the stack. Um, it reserves a chunk of space for a function. Um, it puts all of its variables in there. Um, and when it's done with it, it pops it off. It gets rid of it. Um, this area is called the heap. Uh, this is where variables and the program itself uh, are sometimes kept. Uh, and the text section up here of the program can be kept. Anyone in 355 uh, will be familiar with the text section um, in, in a program in memory. Um, but this is what, uh, this is important to understand. This is what it looks like. If there are any questions, uh, you should ask them now. Because if you don't understand this, this might get, this might turn into a long workshop. Yes, sorry, the, the stack is like the program scratch pad. Um, Emily just typed that into the chat. Uh, that's that's the best way to, to, to think about it. Um, when the program needs to jot something down or, or, or remember something just temporarily, it uses the stack. Um, it puts everything in here, it does whatever it needs to do, and when it's done, it, pops, it gets rid of it. Um, so yeah, think of it like the area that it temporarily writes things down. Um, and I'm just going to tell you now, this is the area of memory that we're going to be focused on, the stack. This is what we're going to be working with. Um, there are other security vulnerabilities that exist with the heap up here. Um, and they work similarly to these, but we're not going to get into them. Um, you might notice that the stack is down here and the heap is up here. They're at two opposite ends of the memory. The heap is up top. The stack is down, down at the bottom. Um, the heap grows down towards the stack, and the stack grows up towards the heap. They, they both head towards the middle. Um, so the stack here is going to move upwards. So when we add things onto the stack, the addresses get smaller and smaller. The stack should start out at the really high addresses um, and then move down. Uh, and these addresses, by the way, are in hex, in case that's not obvious or not familiar to you. Um, they're not just numbers, they're in hex. So uh, 0 through 9 and A through F. So yeah, stack memory is important. Um, for anyone that's not familiar with a stack as a data structure, um, think of it like a stack of plates. Uh, the way that it works is that you pile things on top of each other. 
So uh, in this image over here, you can see uh, this is the stack, the one. When we put something on the stack, it goes on top of the previous value. And new values get, we say, pushed onto the top of the stack. Um, and then we want to take something off. When we want a value, we pop it off. Uh, so here, the six is getting popped off, the five, the four, the three, the two. The problem with this is that if we want the three um, out of this stack here, we need to pop the five and the four off. Uh, and the best way to think of it is like a stack of plates. So uh, the stack of plates works with a first in, first out. Uh, so the, the top plate that goes on is the first plate to get taken off. If we want this plate down here, you're going to have to pick up every plate on top of it um, and get that plate off. If you're lazy and you try to do one of those like tippy and like pull the plate out, you're going to destroy everything. Don't do that. Um, so yeah, the stack is important, and that's the way the stack works. Uh, think of it like a stack of plates. So this is going to be our diagram that we're going to use to represent the stack again. Um, I've divided it up into little sections. Um, so I like to think of this as sort of like a, a shelf. Uh, each one of these is a chunk of memory. It can hold a, a limited amount of bytes, uh, depending on the architecture of the machine. Um, it can hold either four or eight bytes, each one of these, these boxes here, each one of these shelves. Um, four bytes if it's a 32-bit architecture machine. Um, four times eight is 32. Or eight bytes if it's a 64-bit machine. Eight times eight is 64. Um, so we, in this workshop, are going to be using uh, 32 bits because it's just a little bit smaller and a little bit easier to work with. Um, so think of each one of these as 32 bits. If you remember that each character is a byte, um, that means that each one of these can hold four characters. Four times eight is 32. Um, so each one of these is going to hold four characters in all of our examples. They can hold double that in an 8-bit or 64-bit, 8-byte uh, or 64-bit machine. All right. That was a lot of bits, bytes, and words. Um, we also flip this diagram compared to what I showed you last time. So when I showed you uh, how the, the memory is laid out, the heap was up here, and the stack was down here. Um, this image is basically turned upside down. This is the normal way that it's represented. So you'll notice that this is the high memory. This is the bottom of the memory. It's represented as the top in the picture. Um, and this is the low memory. We call it the low memory or the start of the memory. This is where the heap would be way, way down um, at this end. Um, so imagine this as the bottom. This whole thing has been flipped upside down, um, which means that the stack grows this way. It grows down in this picture. Um, and memory writes up. It writes this way. And you'll see what that means uh, in a minute. The way this gets used is that your program, when it's running, uh, takes chunks of this memory uh, for the functions that it calls. And it knows when it's compiled how many of these things that it needs. Um, and it it uh, takes chunks of them uh, when it runs. Anyone who's done 355, you have to calculate how much memory uh, your program needs when it runs everything. And you need to keep track of all of that uh, in ARM assembly. Otherwise, your program crashes and burns really, really quickly. Um, and this is why. Um, so in this example here, um, let's say we have some code over on the side. Um, our code has the main function, um, and the main function calls function one. Um, so when it does that, it goes over here to function one. When function run starts running, function one takes a chunk of memory. Um, so this is function one. It has asked for this much memory. We'll see how much it needs later. Um, function one is going to run, and then it calls function two. And when it calls function two, Function two is then going to take a chunk of memory. Um, and remember, the stack grows this way. So the next function goes on top of the previous one. Uh, and remember, this is upside down, so it grows it grows in this direction. Uh, function two then calls function three. And so function three will take the next chunk of memory. Um, remember that there would be more memory down here uh, on this image, very likely over here as well. Main would have its own, its own chunk of memory. Um, these things are known as stack frames. Um, each function gets its own stack frame. So each one of these holds all of the information 
uh, in the stack that that function has uh, that it uses. Uh, when it builds these, it moves from function one to function two to function three. It needs to know how to get back to the previous function or where to go back into memory uh, in the previous function. And so each one of these keeps a return address. It's something called a return address. So function three will keep a return address to somewhere in function two. Um, function three right here was called that this return address will go to the next line of code that function two is supposed to, to run. Similarly, function two has a return address to function one. Um, so the return address for function one is probably going to be right here to this, this piece of code. Um, so that when function three is finished, the way the computer does is it goes and it looks at the return address and says, all right, I'm finished here. I need to go back to whatever this address is. And it goes back there. Um, and that's how it keeps track of where it is in the memory. So this is an important idea to understand that functions uh, keep a, a return address to whatever called them, whatever whatever ran them. Um, in the same way, if, if this was larger, main would be underneath function one. It would have a stack frame right here. Main would have a return address to wherever the computer was uh, when it called main. It would jump to somewhere else in the memory. So yeah, important to remember, uh, this is the key idea for understanding how to make use of binary or buffer overflows um, is partly that this return address exists. So with that, that's a lot of talking. Um, give, buff, uh, give overflow zero a, a shot uh, and see what it does. I'm going to give you about two minutes from now. This, if we were doing it in person, is where we would have a little music, but no such luck. My Cali. Is it likes to kick me out every time? All right, that's been about a minute, but if anyone's played around with it, they'll know that that's just about enough time. Someone says it just seg faults. <laughs> yep, that's all this program does. Um, we we saw that the first thing you do when you're trying uh, buffer overflows is um, you don't start by running the program. Josh would get mad at me if I told you to just run random programs that people give you. Um, you should look at it and analyze it first. But with these programs, you can just try screaming at them. This program, however, uh, you can't scream at it. It seg faults automatically. Why is it just seg faulting is the question. Um, if anyone can see it, shout it out right away. Otherwise, I'm going to show you what's going on under the hood here. Yeah, this is a self-screaming program. OK, so um, what is this program doing exactly? Yeah, someone's got it. Uh, it copies 128 characters into an array of size 4. Um, so we saw what happens when you try to write too many characters into a buffer that's too small. Um, now I'm going to show you what that looks like sort of under the hood. So. Um, here is uh, the stack memory uh, again. This is these color, this blue color here. We'll say is the memory that the main function has. So main starts out by declaring an array of characters uh, that is 128 uh, characters or 128 bytes. Um, it then also declares an integer i. It then copies. Uh, it loops 128 times. 
and puts the letter A into the character buffer. So uh, remember, memory is going to write uh, this way. Uh, the stack is growing this way. Memory is writing this way. Um, so it's going to start copying these all of these A's, and it's going to copy them in like this. This is what it's going to look like uh, in the memory. Remember, each one of these, uh, this is a 32-bit uh, machine. So each one of these will hold four characters, four bytes. Um, the character A in hex in the ASCII table is 61. So it just copies uh, 61 uh, over and over and over. It then calls this function, pour it on doc. And it passes it uh, the array letters. Uh, so the program then jumps over here to the function pour it on doc. Um, it starts by holding the return address to main. So uh, this is just something random that I've put in there. Um, but this is some address in here somewhere that it wants to go back to. Um, and then this thing called a frame pointer. Uh, we're not going to get into what the frame pointer is. It's important to know that it's there. You're going to need this uh, to do buffer overflows. It's important to remember that before the return address, there is this thing called the frame pointer. Um, but uh, pour it on doc then declares a buffer of four characters. Remember, each one of these holds four characters. So there's the buffer that it asked for in memory, allocates that space. String copy, as we saw, is not a great function. So it starts by copying the A's into the buffer, but it doesn't check to see how big the buffer is, and it just keeps copying. The question is, where does it keep copying? Well, remember, memory writes uh, upwards in this diagram, so it's just going to keep writing uh, the A's. So it writes A's over the frame pointer, it writes A's over the return address, and then it starts writing uh, into the main, uh, into the stack frame for main. Um, these are already just A's, but it's going to start copying over them, um, and it's going to go and go and go. It's going to keep writing and writing and writing. Uh, and when this is done, when it's done copying all of these, the computer is then going to say, OK, this function is finished. Uh, we now have to go to the return address. It looks here at the return address, and it sees this. Uh, and when it tries to jump to that and gets confused, the program crashes. And that's when you get your seg fault. Um, the reason that this happens uh, is because if we go back, um, this return address uh, we saw before looked like this. Um, in memory, the return address is held in hex. Your characters are also held uh, in hex when you look at them, or they're all held in binary, sorry, I should say, um, but they can be represented in hex. Um, when it sees this binary, it thinks that it's supposed to be a return address, so it jumps to that place in memory. Um, it jumps to that address in memory. If we overwrite it with a bunch of A's, it still thinks it's supposed to be an address. And so it sees this as an address somewhere in memory, so it tries to go to this place instead. This place could be anywhere. Uh, at right now, it's 61616161. Um, but that's probably not a place we're allowed to, to be in the memory. And the computer actually knows that we shouldn't be there. And that's what a seg fault is. Um, a seg fault is the computer going, you're not supposed to be here. Something's gone wrong in the program. Crash it. Stop everything. This is very bad. Um, that's what happens with a segmentation fault. Essentially, you're, you've jumped into a place in memory that you're not supposed to be. So that's what's going on. So let's put all of that together now and figure out uh, how we can use that to our advantage. So uh, we have, uh, I'm proud to say, a binary that has been deployed on a droplet so that you can run it uh, and try to get a flag. Um, you have a, a file. If I did this right, the flag should not be in the source code that I gave you. Um, down here where it says password matches, this is instead going to be a flag. Um, if you can get this to work, uh, you will get a flag out of this. You can submit for points. Last year, we couldn't do this because uh, I can't hide flags in these because you guys would just reverse engineer them out instead of actually doing the buffer overflows. Um, we have it deployed on a droplet. So to run it, you run this command and see this IP address and then this port number. There's a space in between the IP address, the port number, and, and these two things. 
Um, when you do that, it'll run the program and you can give it some input. So uh, what's going on here? Uh, remember, every program in C starts at main. It's going to say if verify password. Um, verify password is this right here. It's this function. Uh, verify password declares an integer r, uh, a character array that holds a password that's 16 characters, and then a character array that is a buffer that is also 16 characters. It then calls this thing rand string um, for a password. Um, I'm not going to step through this. Essentially, what this is doing is generating some random password. Uh, here's all of the characters that it can use. Uh, it is going through and just grabbing a random character. It's grabbing 16 of them, and it's generating uh, a random. Uh, it's generating a random password. Um, the program then says, "Please enter your password." And what you're supposed to do is figure out the password. Uh, so it uses gets. Um, it then does a memory compare between the password that it randomly generated and the buffer, which is where you put your, your password in. Uh, if they're the same, it will print out the flag for you. Otherwise, it'll say incorrect password, login attempt reported to administrator. Um, yeah, someone already got the flag. Uh, it's not, it shouldn't be too difficult. Um, it should be, actually, some of you should get it without knowing why you necessarily got it to begin with. Um, but yeah, this is the challenge. I'll give you guys a few minutes to work on this. Uh, let's, let's give it about four minutes. When you get it, uh, just toss it into chat uh, that you got it, just so I have an idea of how far along everyone is. Try running it here. Two more minutes, only one person has said that they've found the flag so far. So you shouldn't, you, you don't necessarily need a VM to run this. Um, you should be able to netcat in. You should be able to netcat in pretty easily. I'm in 525, it's cheating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, if you're in 525, this is a bit of a toy example. Uh, the assignment two that we did in computer science 525 was big bad versions of some of these or things that are by comparison, much more difficult. Still only one person has told me that they got the flag. I'll give you one more minute. OK, 
Callie gives everyone grief. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> All right. 10 more seconds. And let's call it their time. A um, few people got the flag. I'm guessing there might be just a lot of people sort of watching in the background and not trying it out. Um, but yeah, uh, the vulnerability here lies in the fact that the password and the buffer that takes the input are next to each other in the program right here. Um, and we use the gets function so our we can write outside of the buffer. So let's take a look at how this is working uh, in memory with an, another diagram. So uh, this is the, the main function. Let's say it just has a return address and a frame pointer. Uh, it starts by calling verify password. The program jumps up here, gets a chunk of memory. It gets the return address to main and a frame pointer. Then it needs some space. So it asks for the integer the password, and the buffer. Uh, it then calls rand string. Remember, that's the other function that generates the random uh, password. Um, so it generates a random password for us. Uh, then it prints something for us. Print is another function. It would get its own stack frame as well and then come back. Uh, and then it calls gets, and it takes what you call and gets and puts it into the buffer. Um, so let's say that you used the input uh, one two three four five six seven eight nine one two three four five six seven. So that's sixteen characters. Um, it would put them into memory. It would look like this. Uh, these are the hex representations of these digits. And if that's what you put in, it would compare this uh, to this random password in here. Um, it would very likely find that they are not the same. Um, if randomly this happened to be the password that it generated, uh, congratulations, that would be extremely rare. Um, but instead, what we're going to do is we're going to overflow the buffer. So uh, remember that the password and the buffer are declared next to each other in, in the program. Where they're declared uh, changes where they exist in memory. Um, so if we declared them in different orders, they would be in different places. But this is something that actually happens in real life in programs. Um, this is why it's good to know uh, even just some of the basics of these things uh, so that you know that if you did something like this, uh, it would be possibly a vulnerability in your program. So we, knew, we know that we can write into memory if we want. And of course, the trick is we're going to keep uh, we're going to put more stuff in than buffer is supposed to take. Buffer takes 16 characters. We're going to write past that. And when we write past that, we're going to overwrite whatever the password is in memory. So we're going to write the same thing twice. This is our uh, this is our original attempt. We're just going to copy it and paste it in again. And when we do that, you're going to notice the password changes. And now these two things are the same in memory. Uh, the program will then run the memory compare and tell you that you got the right password. And congratulations, you've just overflowed a buffer successfully to exploit a program, and you're hacker man. And this is the greatest feeling in the world, uh, except that this is a very simple example. Um, we're going to try another one now called Overflow 2. Um, and this one is a big step up in difficulty. Um, so this is the command to connect. Uh, the same thing, just it's 8090 instead of 8080. Uh, here, is, here is the program. Uh, so you're going to go into main. Uh, it's going to tell you, it's going to ask you to enter input. It's then going to run the function totally safe. Totally safe here has a character, a buffer, uh, of ca a character buffer, sorry. It has 40 characters in it, and then it calls gets. Uh, so it'll put stuff into this buffer. The point of this exercise is to jump up to this function called print me. Uh, here it says, well done, you overflowed the buffer. Uh, instead, what you want, uh, or what, what's going to happen for you when you connect to this and successfully execute it, is that it's going to print out a flag for you. Um, 
I'm going to step you through this. Uh, and this one very likely will require uh, pwn tools to do. Uh, so that's the first hint I'm going to give you, is that this is not as easy as simply overflowing a buffer. I'm going to give you guys five minutes to work on this one. Let me know when you get it. Um, and yeah, I hope, I, I expect some people might get it in five minutes if we have some 5 to 5 people here. Um, but this is this can be really finicky. Uh, so let me know uh, when you got this. Uh, but we're going to go over how to do this using Pwn tools uh, and demoing it uh, with another diagram like we did before. And I believe, I'm not sure if people are doing it, but there is the breakout rooms in Discord, in our Discord server down here. Uh, remember, you can always jump into those if you want to work with other people on these. It might help uh, to go a little better if you have someone to work with. There's a question, is Pwn Tools anything like GDB? Um, not not really. Um, no, GDB is sort of a specific tool, a specific like program um, that you run that does something. Pwn Tools is uh, more like a library that has a bunch of functions um, built in that help you, help you to do things. Um, Rebecca is probably going to be pretty frustrated. She was in 525. Ah, Kali's not recognizing GDB nor Pwn Tools as a command. That's right, because you had to install both of those uh, to get this workshop running. Um, if you haven't done that yet, uh, let me find the address for it. If you go to this website here, this is a Git repo um, for Pwn Tools. Uh, the first, one of the only things here in the readme is installation. Here are the commands right here to install it. And remember, uh, run those one at a time. <laughs> oh, they didn't. They didn't copy very well. Uh, yeah, maybe ignore that. You ran those. That's what I was complaining about earlier with the hash mis mismatch. Um, you're going to have to tell someone a little more in depth about what the hash mismatch is. Uh, I would recommend maybe going to our Discord. And I think someone might be able to help you there. I'm not sure what the hash mismatch is, what exactly is happening. Then it magically worked. OK. If you're asking how do you use Pwn Tools, uh, Alex helped you. Okay, awesome.
All right, let me know if you guys want more time to keep playing with it, or if I should start stepping you through a bit of what's going on here. You shouldn't be able to solve this one by hand willy-nilly. I'm not seeing anything in the chat, so I'm going to go ahead then. Um, yeah, so we know what this program is doing. Um, the, the big problem that we should notice is that uh, we need to jump from this function, totally safe, to this function, print me. Uh, this program never actually calls that function. Uh, in this code here, this should never actually be run. Uh, because it's never called. Um, as a programmer, if your program could get here, uh, you should be pretty pretty surprised. Uh, either something amazing or terrible has probably happened. Um, and this is the core of what makes buffer overflows uh, so uh, so bad. So uh, let's take a look at what the program does. So uh, main calls totally safe. Totally safe then asks for a bunch of space. Uh, it gets a it calls a bunch of space for the character buffer uh, for our string, and then it calls gets. Uh, we are going to yell at our program the way we did before, um, but we're going to keep going. We're going to overwrite the frame pointer, and this is the important part. This is the trick to all of it. We're going to overwrite the return address to main to instead be the return address of print me. So when this is when totally safe is done, it should jump back over here into the main function. Instead, we're going to put we're going to change the the return address and we're going to have it jump instead into here and run this printf statement. Um, and that's that should be pretty mind blowing. Sorry, I'm just taking out some of the chat messages. Yeah, it looks like some people are having problems with pwn tools. Um, I'm going to also demo uh, what's going on there. So yeah, we want to we want to overwrite the return address to main with the return return address to print me, so that when we finish this function, we go up here instead of back down here in the code. So. Let's go to Kali. Uh, just a second, sorry. Um, oh, I, I didn't actually demo for you guys uh, overflow one. Um, sorry, this let's let's do this first. I'm sorry, I, I jumped ahead here. Um, so overflow one was the one that we wanted to enter the password, and this is where we enter the password, but twice the size. Uh, so I said one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, four, five, six. I think that was it. Um, what is that? Nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Yeah, 15. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and that one tells me that the password matches. Um, anyone who followed the advice that they were given at the beginning and just did this uh, would have also found that their password would match. Uh, notice that if we go too far, our program just crashes. Uh, we wouldn't have gotten the flag. Uh, sometimes uh, screaming in the right amount works. The reason that this works um, is that it's basically doing what this was doing up here. So it's saying that your password is all A's and that it's overwriting the random password with all A's. Um, it's not writing too many A's. The rest of these are going to overwrite the return address uh, in the program and crash it. So it's just kind of luck if you got the right amount of A's, if you yelled out at the right amount, uh, that that would happen. OK. Um, so now we want to play around with Pwn Tools. Uh, so Pwn Tools is a library. It uses Python um, because it's wonderful. 
all things wonderful in life use Python. Um, so we're going to use it. Uh, it uses Python 3, so we're going to load up Python 3. Um, if people are just trying to load it using Python, uh, you're going to load into Python 2. Um, and then you're going to try from pwn import star. And it's going to tell you that it has no module named pwn. Um, that's because uh, right around the time that we did this earlier this year, uh, pwn tools, I believe, was still using Python 2. And they made the switch right around the time that we did this. Um, Nope, I want Python 3. Uh, so you want to load Python 3. You want to make sure you load Python 3 here, because this is where it's going to be. Um, I then type from pwn import star. Um, this now loads the pwn tools library uh, into Python here so that I can use it. Um, so let me go back to, ah, I need a new, a new window. Um, Let's go to overflow two. Um, it asks us for input. Uh, we're gonna try what we usually try. We try screaming at it. Um, and we see how how much we get a seg fault. So we know somewhere there's a buffer overflow and that the program is crashing. This is usually a good sign that there's a buffer overflow. Um, we've taken a look at the program uh, and we know what it does. So here we know that there's a character buffer and that the buffer contains 40 characters. Um, knowing what we know over here, we know that there are uh, there's going to be space for 40 characters, then there's going to be a frame pointer, and then the address uh, that returns to main. This is what we want to overwrite. Uh, so we know that we need to put in 40 characters, then another four characters here, and then we want to somehow get the return address uh, to print me. Um, let's pretend that we didn't know how big that buffer was first. Um, Pwn Tools has something that's built in uh, that is very nice uh, that helps us with that. It's something called cyclic. So it's a function called cyclic, and I'm going to ask it for 100 characters. If I type cyclic properly, it works a lot better. Um, and it gives us this. So this is a sequence of characters. Uh, that it's going to put in. If you take a look at it, you're going to notice that it's a bunch of A's, um, then A's and a B, then A's and a C, then A's and a D. Um, and the sequence just continues uh, with changing the last character. You're going to also notice that it's it's three A's and then a, and then a character, three A's and then a character. Um, this is because it's going to write these into uh, memory. It's going to remember each one of those those spaces in memory is going to take four characters. So this is going to help us to identify where uh, the buffer overflow is. So we're going to take that. We're going to copy it. Uh, I'm going to go back to my program here. Uh, paste my selection. So I can put this in, but as we can see, we still just get a seg fault. Um, GDB is going to be our friend here. So we're going to go run GDB. Um, and then we want run, and we're going to paste. Uh, that's going to be the argument that we provide the program. Uh, oh, sorry. I need to go back to the beginning. I think we need to tell it. Oh, no, no, sorry. This isn't a, this isn't a command line input. We put this in after the program runs. Um, so we're going to tell it to run. It's going to say starting the program. Uh, now it wants us to enter input. Now we're going to paste our selection. Don't know why it did that. Run again. Start it again. Yes. Paste. There we go. Um, so we're going to put that in. And GDB tells us that the program received uh, the signal and it seg faulted uh, and it crashed. That's great. Uh, but what GDB is going to do is it's going to tell us where it seg faulted. Um, so what it's showing us here is this is the address that it tried to return to. It's saying that it's in, it doesn't know where this is, um, but this is the address that it tried to jump to. So that's the address we want. Uh, what's that? What that's going to tell us is how big the buffer is. Just grab this. Um, and then we're going to go back to our other window with Pwn Tools. And we're going to use now 
cyclic find. If I have this right. Nope, not quite. I need an O, I believe, at the beginning of that. Yeah, cyclic find, and it tells us that it's 52. Um, so it's telling us that we need 52 characters to overwrite uh, the return address. Um, what this has done, 616161 6E, um, 6E, which one is 6E? My good friend ASCIItable.com. Uh, hex 6E is N. Uh, so what that is telling us is that this right here, A, 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 N, that's the point in this string where we overwrote the return address. So everything from here to here, that's going to be the number of characters we need before we get to the return address. Um, so this is a nice feature from Pwn Tools. Basically, it tells us how far we have to, uh, how many A's we have to write before we get, uh, how many of these spaces we have to write before we get here. Um, you might notice that I had told you that there's going to be 40, and then there's going to be another four, and then uh, the address of print me. Um, there is an explanation for why it's 52 and not 44. Um, off the top of my head, I, I can't remember what it is. Um, some of these programs will change slightly depending on how they're compiling, how they're compiled. Um, there will be extra things tossed in there. Um, so this cyclic find is really important. It's going to tell you how many characters you need to put in. Otherwise, you might be reduced to just trying a few more characters, trying a few more characters, trying a few more characters. Um, so now we know how many, how much, how many A's uppercase, how much we have to scream at it before we get to the return address. Um, this is where we're going to start using um, uh, some nice features of Pwn tools. Um, so we're going to say um, E is equal to ELF of dot space. Uh, what's this? Overflow 2? Is this program overflow 2? Yes. Um, overflow two. So what this is going to do um, is basically load the program in as this variable e. Uh, Pwn tools will take a look at it uh, and tell us some information about it. All of this stuff is telling us about the security uh, in this program. Uh, you can see that it's a 32-bit binary as well uh, in little endian. Um, all of the security is basically turned off. Um, I've turned all of the security off on these programs. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about the security that's built in to stop this stuff. Um, but I've turned all that security off so that you can do this stuff. Um, so we want padding is going to be equal to binary A times 52. Um, believe that's how that's going to work. Yeah. Um, so what this is doing is making this variable padding equal to basically 52 A's uh, in in binary or in bytes. Um, we then want to know where we want to jump to, which function we want to jump to. Uh, we want to jump to print me is the name of our function. Um, so jump is going to be equal to p32 of e dot symbols b of leave print me. Um, and this is why I told you guys, uh, this is not something you can basically do by hand. Uh, you could probably get the idea of how to do this, but uh, it's really tricky to figure out exactly what to do here. Um, what this is doing is, so this is the padding. This is how many, sorry, how many A's we have to put in. Um, this is now the address. So what we want is the address of print me. We want to know what its address in memory is so that we can overwrite the return address to main with the return address to print me. What this is saying is go into that program, 
find the print me function um, and pack it uh, in 32 bit little endian form. So this is going to uh, turn our return address into something that can just automatically be written into the program. Uh, anyone in 525 uh, is probably going, oh, I wish we had this before. Um, Mocha doesn't have this built in, I don't believe. Actually, I know it doesn't because I tried it, um, but it's really nice to have. So we're going to say that. And now it's upset with me. Um, what is it upset about? Just print me. I'm doing something wrong and I can't remember what it is. Maybe the function wasn't actually called this or maybe it was just print with a capital M E. There we go. I think we were almost right the first time. No, it's still not happy with this. Don't think it's that. Why is it unhappy with this statement? This is where you get to watch Jeremy fail at things. <laughs> Maybe I'll just take it as print me is not defined. It is called print me. Oh, did I? No, it's still called print me. Just a second. Did I change the name of the function in the program files that I gave you guys? No, it's still called print me. Program still runs. Let's run strings on it and see if I changed it. Nope, print me is still in there. I'm doing something wrong here. And I can't remember what it is. This worked before. Symbols, symbols is spelled correctly. Womp womp, sorry guys. Um, the way that we fix this is we go into GDB and we check overflow two. Um, and then we disassemble print me. Yes. Okay. Um, so what I've just done is I've gone into GDB. I've typed uh, DISAS for disassemble uh, and then asked it to disassemble the print me function. Um, and it is showing me an address here. So this is the address of the print me function. I was trying to get this automatically and I'm not sure why it wasn't doing it. Um, people are saying things in the chat. Uh, let me get, just try it. Print me without the B. Nope. <laughs> I, I can't tell if people know what the answer are or if they're just telling me to try things. Praises be. <laughs> All right, points to Josh. Um, if I print jump, yeah, okay. Um, so thank you, Josh, you got it. 
Um, notice that this was the address that I pulled out of GDB. This is the memory address where print me starts. This is the address we want to jump to. Um, this command that we just did here was going into the program, finding the print me function, um, and then packing the address in little endian. So uh, when I printed it, it looks like this. Um, that should look uh, kind of backwards from this. Uh, the reason is that in uh, some computers, uh, most computers, I believe, in hardware, um, the addresses are stored backwards from the way that we would read them in English. Uh, so you can see that it starts with 82. So these are the first, uh, the first two uh, bytes of the address, uh, then 91, 91 here. 0, 04, 0, 04, and 0, 08, and 0, 08. Uh, this is why I say that to do this by hand is uh, really tedious. Uh, it's very easy to mess up this return address. It's also very easy to mess up the command to actually get the return address. Um, so uh, with that, we should have, I believe, uh, we're going to say that our payload is equal to our padding plus jump, and we're going to print payload. And that's the input that we can give it in order to go to the print me function. So um, this is 52 A's that we've set up. And then this is the address uh, that we want to overwrite to go to print me. So I'm going to copy that. Uh, we're going to quit. And if everything worked properly, I'm not convinced it did. We're going to run overflow two uh, with our input. And we seg fault. We seg fault because something isn't quite right. Uh, let's try, oh, I can't go back here. Um, let's try taking off four A's. And this is the part where binary exploitation gets really tricky. Also the part where you're supposed to practice this before the workshop, Jeremy. So it's still seg faulting should be printing a flag for us. Uh, so one, two, three, four. Still seg faulting. So what have we taken off? Eight, or was it 52? That should be 48. I'm guessing that the next one should work. Cyclic find might have lied to us. No, that's not what I want. I want overflow two. Still seg faulting. Two, three, four. Somewhere here, we're going to overwrite the buffer in the right way. Oh, I'm getting worried. One, two, three, four. Oh, wait. Um, it's not taking this in bytes. That's the problem. Ah, that's the problem. This is supposed to be bytes. Um, instead, what we're going to do is um, we're going to write this to a file. Um, pathlib import. Um, so it's interpreting these, I believe, uh, literally, not as hex bytes. I think it's just taking these in as characters. Um, I'm going to write these to a file. Uh, path in dot write bytes payload. Will that do it? 
Yeah, so that should have written a new file for us. Ah, called in. Now, if I cat in and put it into overflow two, sorry. Oh, I've just killed it too, haven't I? I think I just overwrote the program. Womp womp. Yep, I just overwrote the program. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, this is the fun of binary exploitation. Um, no, we're gonna we're gonna get this right. Let me just download it again. Actually, do I still have it in downloads? I do not. And he cancels it. This is what happens when the pressure is on. If you need to go get a cup of tea, now might be a good time. Let's extract it. There you are. Come with me. Get rid of my program. So yeah, one way to do it is to completely just overwrite the program, which I do not recommend. And now if I run overflow two, excellent, okay. One more time, second verse, same as the first. Yeah. That. <laughs> Glorious victory. <laughs> um, we got the message we wanted. Enter input, well done. Uh, you overflowed the buffer. Um, and then it seg faults. Um, if you're at home cheering quietly to yourself, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry that was so difficult. That is why we're supposed to practice these things before we get to the workshop. Um, and now I'm looking at your chat messages. Oh, you guys have been here the whole time. Very kind. And yeah, uh, Josh, who loves binary exploitation, says binary exploitation, not even once. This is not his favorite category, and this is why. It is tedious, really tedious sometimes. Um, but yeah, this is what it should look like. Um, and I know that that might have seemed really complicated uh, inside of uh, Python. Um, sorry, I'm going to quit out of here. Um, let's go vim exploit. Um, if we were to write a program uh, or a, a script to do this, uh, we would say um from path lib import path from pwn import star um so these are the things i i did these both on the screen before but we'd say e is equal to elf of um overflow two um and this is following uh Brandon, this is going to map the binary. Uh, then we're going to say that padding is equal to the byte of A times, I believe it was 52. That's going to be our padding bytes. Uh, our jump. Jump address is going to be equal to, uh, and if nobody knows this off top of their heads by now, uh, it's your fault because, no, no, I can't see it, but I can hear you guys screaming at me already. Um, print me. That's going to be 
address of print me. Um, payload is going to be equal to padding plus jump address. It's the payload. Clean that up, make it look nice. And then uh, this is the one that I wrote that's going to write our program. Write bytes payload. Uh, no, we're going to write to in. Uh, so it's going to create a file called in, and it's going to write that payload into that file. Um, so this would be a script, a Python script, uh, that would write our payload for us. I'm going to write and quit that. Um, we now have, so if I run Python 3 exploit EOL while scanning. It's upset about something there. I've put something wrong in there. Um, but I'm not going to hold this workshop up any longer. Um, this has taken far longer than even I expected it to. And I didn't think I was going to get it on the first shot. But um, that's a little look at, at what that does. Uh, so yeah, this program, we have gone from this function here uh, into print me, printed out the string. If you're doing this at home, you've printed out the flag. Uh, if you've done it with that uh, that netcat command. Um, and yeah, we've jumped into the printf function. Um, so last, last year uh, in the winter when we did this, I then had another challenge called overflow three, where I showed you, uh, I demoed how shellcode worked. I did that right at the end of the workshop. Um, it took me a while. I got that wrong about 20 times before it worked. It was also uh, right around, I forgot another quote mark. Okay, I'll go back and fix that after. Um, yeah, last year when we did this, uh, this was the problem that gave me the hardest time. Um, I got this right at the two hour mark. Um, but the idea is that uh, in the last example, we put an address uh, of a function that we wanted to return to. Um, you should have seen and you should understand by now that those spaces in memory that we saw, those can hold data. Um, or they can hold programming code. For the computer, it's both the same thing. Um, for anyone in 355, uh, you've heard of a uh, of RISC and CISC architectures, um, or a von Neumann architecture, which can hold uh, both programs and data in the same memory. Um, that's how this works. Um, and so, yeah, the shell code. Uh, the idea behind shellcode is that instead of giving it a return address, you can write a program into memory and then jump into that program uh, to take control of it. Um, if you understand everything that we've done here today, the next step is to understand shellcode and ROP chains. Uh, shellcode is an upcoming workshop that we have on February 1st uh, in 2021 that's being taught by uh, Brandon. Um, and so you'll see a program like this. And you'll learn not how to control the program, but to how to take control of the computer. Uh, you can become the root user uh, if you do this properly. Um, so yeah, that's how that that's a future workshop called on shellcode. Uh, he'll teach you how to write the shellcode and how to execute it. Uh, I've gone over it. Uh, it's challenging, but if you understand this and you think that this is neat, uh, that one's going to blow your mind about the stuff that you'll be able to do uh, with programs. Um, and so all of this uh, overflows uh, come out of this paper. So this is just a little uh, going over the last things. Uh, 1996, uh, this is published in Frack Magazine by someone uh, identifying themselves as Aleph One, a paper called Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit. It's a very famous uh, paper. It details how this works. This, this is also known as uh, stack smashing. Um, and he basically discloses that there's this massive security bug in C. Uh, and since then, uh, this has been the top vulnerability out there. Um, Smashing the stack for fun and profit was the name of the paper uh, written by Aleph One. 
Um, and it's the first article that really details how stack smashing works and demos how to do it. Uh, you'll read it in 525 uh, if you go to that class. It's available online and for free. Um, an example of something that is in this family of exploits uh, is something called Heartbleed. I saw someone mention it earlier. Uh, Heartbleed is a very famous uh, vulnerability that existed within uh, server architecture. Uh, and it was not a buffer overflow, but a buffer over read. Uh, so similar idea. Uh, this XKCD comic details it quite nicely. Um, so what would happen was you would ask a server for something and you would tell it how long the reply should be. Uh, so in this case, uh, Meg is asking for uh, asking the server if it's still there. If it is, reply with potato, which is six letters. The server replies with potato. Uh, then she says, if you're there, reply bird, four letters. The server says, Meg wants these four letters, bird. Meg gets crafty and says, if you're there, reply hat 500 letters. Uh, and in this case, the server uh, replies hat, but then keeps writing whatever is in its memory past uh, the words hat and prints out all of this stuff. Uh, Meg is now writing all of this down. What kind of stuff could Meg get from this? Uh, Meg could get what other people are asking for, uh, variables that are running on the program, maybe uh, passwords, files that people are looking for. Uh, this is a major problem. Uh, this was called Heartbleed. When this uh, vulnerability was revealed, um, one piece of advice uh, that was given by, I think it was Wired Magazine, was uh, just stay off the internet for a few days if you value privacy at all. Uh, it turns out that this had been out there for a year or two, I believe. Um, and it was a major uh, security vulnerability. Again, this is called an overread, uh, not an overwrite. So this is just, it's reading past memory where it's supposed to, but again, it's just not checking the bounds um, on variables. Um, so that's a famous example of a yeah, buffer overread. It's a programming error. Um, so with that, uh, we are finished uh, for tonight. Uh, anyone have any questions? By all means, uh, just ask. Uh, there's been lots of stuff going on in there. And is anyone else not able to pipe the in file to the NC command? Oh no, that might be a problem. Uh, let me fix my file. I didn't actually test the pipe. I assumed the pipe worked. Come on, Vim, work with me. Um, before people leave, I'm going to let you know that this is the last workshop we've done for this year. Uh, next week, we are going to be hanging out and playing games. Uh, we haven't decided exactly which games. There might be some Among Us. Um, there might be some uh, CTF style stuff going on. But essentially, we're just going to hang out in the Discord server for the end of the semester uh, and hopefully talk to one another and do some socializing so that uh, it's not all of us staring at a screen while someone flounders around with programs um, while the rest of us scream and gnash our teeth. Um, Good, that should be there. Uh, yep, that should be should be the right bytes. 41s and then our return address. Okay. Um, the question is, what was the address? Oh, look, people have sent me a whole bunch of messages on Discord. <laughs> I'm guessing about what we've done here in the workshop. Uh, let me get, let me get the address for that again. So that's the netcat I just popped in there. 67.99.96.12 8090. Oh. Okay. 
I didn't test the binary deploy that we did for this. And this is because we only figured out how to do this just before this workshop started. Um, in which case, this isn't going to work this way. Um, did someone get it? I'm just looking down here. Ah, someone is saying that this is a sample of one that they've done before. Um, no. No. Um, that I don't believe is going to be it. But if we reverse it, that might be it. We're getting further away from it, maybe. Yeah, I think it's just holding here now. All right, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, what has happened is that uh, the way that we built this isn't working to pipe stuff in um, because I we didn't actually get to test it with this beforehand. So what I'm going to do Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop the compiled binary for overflow two with the flag in it uh, into the Discord uh, for you guys to try it out on. Um, if you're sneaky uh, and lack scruples, you'll just uh, pull it out of the binary. It should be really easy because it's not hidden in there. Um, but go ahead and try your exploit out on it anyway. Um, you're only cheating yourself, uh, although you're getting those sweet, sweet points. Um, but it's nice to know that your exploit worked and to actually get it working. Um, so let me drop that in there now. Otherwise, um, we're all finished. That's it for this semester. Um, thank you guys for joining, for joining us. Uh, and remember, if you're in this beginner workshop, um, there are no beginner workshops for next semester. Um, this was meant to give you uh, an intro to all the basic categories of uh, CTFs. And in doing so, uh, you've learned all of the basic skills uh, that you need to get through the rest of our workshops. So um, understanding how this works means that you can do the uh, the shellcode uh, workshop. Um, having done SQL injections, you can now, uh, you should have a better understanding of how cross-site scripting works. Um, so there will only be one workshop every week uh, starting in January. Um, and we still have three more speakers coming up uh, next year. We're, or uh, yeah, yeah, technically next year, uh, starting in January. Um, we're going to have Adam McMath, who uh, works for the Calgary Airport Authority, uh, works in cybersecurity, in uh, threat analysis and threat hunting. And his talk, I believe, is going to be awesome. Uh, we got to talk to him at B-Sides uh, at the end. We hung out with him for about an hour, hour and a half, and he is great. Um, uh, Joel Reardon, Dr. Joel Reardon is going to be coming in talking about privacy in COVID tracing apps. Uh, some research that he's done. Anyone that's ever seen any of his talks will know uh, that his research and his talks are fantastic. Uh, the end of the semester, we'll have Emily Vincent, who is a hiring manager, who will be coming in to talk to us uh, about applying for jobs and uh, the hiring process. Uh, which should also be great. Um, otherwise, the CTF is also taking place. Uh, Signups for that for everybody uh, that's not a premium member will start tomorrow. Um, and yeah, 
Otherwise, next week, we'll be playing some games and just hanging out, uh, trying to relax a little bit uh, as the end of the semester happens. Uh, I know everyone's got a lot of papers and projects to do. Uh, it's pretty insane, uh, but you're doing great and you can get through it. Um, remember to come and hang out in our Discord channel. We've got a playlist that is running. You can add music to it, stuff you like to study to. Um, and feel free to just hang out in a voice channel. If you do that, uh, people will just come over and hang out with you. I promise. Uh, everyone's just sitting at home, uh, waiting for some place to hang out. Oh, that's too bad. Um, yeah, otherwise, uh, that's, that's it. Uh, thank you guys for sticking around for all these workshops. Um, we hope you... Hope you felt like this helped. Um, yeah, we'll see you next week. And uh, thank you for following along tonight. Uh, I know it got a little touch and go and tedious there for a while, but uh, I think that's a pretty good taste of how binary exploitation actually works. So uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for hanging out and uh, have a good night.